And this is really where I feel like religion has failed all of us. You know, it's really astounding to me that we haven't made a full investment in solar, considering how many religions worship the damn sun. Right? I mean, if Ra or Surya, who are both sun gods, <laughs> saw our dependency on fossil fuels, they'd solar flare us out of existence. <laughs> Infidels. <laughs> yeah. Hello, and welcome to a brand new episode of Forkful of Noodles. I'm your host, Chris Mohan. Hey, as you might notice in this episode, you're probably going to hear some people laughing and, and, and kind of chatting in the background uh, with me th throughout the episode, and that's because it was filmed, uh, recorded earlier in front of a live virtual stand-up comedy audience. Uh, I do uh, these shows called the Citizen Revolution Live Virtual Stand-Up Comedy Shows, which become episodes of Forkful of Noodles. So if you're interested in being a part of that live virtual audience, you totally can uh, by clicking the ticket link in the description below. We are going to have a bunch of these shows throughout the year, especially because I am uh, unfortunately not able to tour and go around the country like I normally do. So I've got a bunch of these live virtual stand-up comedy shows each week brand new material each week we also find a brand new grassroots organization to uh to donate to uh to to partner up with uh this for this episode we partnered up with the pittsburgh mutual aid and if you would like to donate to them there is a link in the description for that as well uh and uh if you would like to get early access to full episodes of Forkful of Noodles, both parts into one video, the, the multi-part episode. If you'd also like to see uh, what the Citizen Revolution uh, the shows are all about, the discussions that we have at the end of these shows, uh, you can do so by becoming a sustaining member. And you can go right onto my website, krishmohanhaha.com, and you can become a sustaining member there. That's K-R-I-S-H-M-O-H-A-N-H-A-H-A.com. Uh, become a sustaining member. You get early access to these full episodes. You get uh, unreleased stand-up comedy tracks as storytelling content. You get some bonus merch. You get early access to, to my live comedy albums when I drop those. Uh, you get a bunch of cool perks, uh, and it helps the quality and quantity of these shows to improve as well. Uh, now, uh, thank you for, for tuning in. We're going to talk about West Virginia, you guys. West Virginia has, uh, is a state that's often the butt of uh, many people's jokes for being the home of backwoods, toothless, inbred hicks, right? Some, some people might even know what... <laughs> usually the jokes that come out for, uh, about West Virginia. They're usually true. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <Been very>, yeah. <laughs> so some people might also know West Virginia for its country <laughs> roads. That will take you home, whether you want to go there or not. To the place <laughs> of... We can't turn this into a karaoke show. <laughs> Damn it. Look. West Virginia. <laughs> I, I brought this on myself. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I guess according to John Denver, all country roads either lead to Charleston or Beckley instead of Rome. That's where they all go. <laughs> but here's the thing. Here's the thing, you guys. Everything we know about West Virginia has been co-opted by corporate propaganda to push this narrative of ignorance, divide, and backwoods unimportance. Even the origins of West Virginia itself has been romanticized as this abolitionist dreamscape, right? This, the story that we're told about West Virginia is that they annexed from like regular Virginia because they didn't want slavery. But in reality, it had nothing to do with abolition at all, but everything to do with Civil War supply lines. And there were plenty of people in the state of West Virginia that were very excited about owning people. <laughs> 
Now, famed $5 bill, Abraham Lincoln. Uh, he, <laughs> 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 Abe Lincoln went to uh, the northern industrialists who owned most of the railroads, timber, and coal yards and offered them up West Virginia as compensation for helping out the Union Army. The real story is, is that in the Civil War, Abraham Lincoln had to keep the supply lines open. He had to keep his troops supplied. And so he made a deal with the owners of the railroad, which were the Northern industrialists. And he said, keep my troops supplied. Let's get through this Civil War. And that beautiful little piece of land known now as West Virginia will be yours. Lots of coal, lots of timber, lots of money to be made in West Virginia. And that's what happened. So in 1863, this place became what's now known as the 35th state, West Virginia. Now, Lincoln essentially sold the state out to profiteers as the state's inception, right? Really, West Virginia is the first state to become a corporation. Therefore, it is the first state to get personhood, which is very exciting and also kind of a bummer because for like a long time, black people were like only three fifths of a person, but like West Virginia just got all of the fifths of being a person like pretty immediately. It's kind of shitty, kind of shitty thing to do. But after the Civil War, West Virginia basically became the spot for the coal industry to get cheap labor. And this is this is really where the real history of West Virginia begins. Between 1880 and 1919, the state's population went from 93,000 to 446,000. And this is because the coal companies built little towns around coal mines and needed people to occupy and work the mines. By the time Ellis Island opened up in the 1890s, the coal bosses sent out recruiters to bring immigrants into the mines. So the coal industry sent guys to places like Ellis Island, to the ports, and they would pluck us off the boats and say, hey, you sir, are you looking for that new life? Are you looking for work? Are you looking for everything you've ever dreamed of? Get your bags, get your family, come with us. And they put us on trains and they brought us to West Virginia. And they put us to work mining coal. Now, the recruiters promised these immigrants, you know, a new life, you know, to, to help them take care of their families. And at this point, too, there were some pretty large strikes that had taken center stage, um, and the working class were becoming far more empowered as well. Uh, so in order to circumvent things like, you know, paying like fair wages and giving people human dignity, the coal bosses hired the immigrants that didn't have an opportunity to become part of the labor movement so they could be very easily exploited for the work. You know, this is kind of how business is done, right? This is what MBAs teach you. When you get a master's in business, this is, this is like lesson 101. Step one, hire immigrants. Step two, exploit immigrants. <laughs> <laughs> Step three, purchase respect, always keep the receipts. Always. <laughs> <laughs> Always. <laughs> you never know when you need to return that respect, right? And then you get your master's degree in business, you guys. That's how it works. But <laughs> this, this notion alone debunks the whole, they took our jobs argument, right? Nobody took anybody's job. The bosses handed the, uh, these jobs to the immigrants under the guise of better lives for their families, right? The jobs were there for the taking, but the working class didn't really want any of these jobs, right? The people weren't really into the coal industry all that much. They, they, liked, it. they liked the coal industry as a friend. You know what I'm saying? Like they, <laughs> <laughs> but they weren't ready to commit. So in a jealous rage, the coal industry <laughs> decided to use immigrants against the working class. And the sad part about that is it kind of worked, right? Like 
Like these corporations. They're, they're in an entanglement. <laughs> they're in an entanglement, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Which is a Will and Jada Pickett Smith reference. <laughs> but these corporations essentially created and benefited from anti immigrant xenophobia. Now, once these immigrants, and also they were hiring former slaves in these coal, town, coal towns as well, uh, they, they weren't paid by the hour, uh, by the hour, right? They were paid by the ton. It depended on how much ton of coal you ex extracted from the earth. So it didn't matter how many hours you put in. But here's the real kicker. They weren't paid in real dollars. They were paid in something called scrip, which was made up by the coal bosses. Miners were paid in scrip. Um, oftentimes, never saw real money. And if, if the company caught you with real money, you might well lose your job or they'd put you in a bad place to work until you understood that you were supposed to deal only at the company store and such. I had some, I had some uh, uh, hard-ass bosses. I had some hard bosses then. And uh, if they could put it over on you, if they could put it over on you, they'd make you do any damn thing for nothing. That guy is from, uh, like, like, he fought in the mine wars, which we're going to talk about in a, in a minute. The videos that he's involved in are fucking awesome. He's a badass. But the script is kind of where monopoly money originated, right? Because it's basically play money. It, it, it's disguising a new era of wage slavery is really what it was doing. And this kept the miners subservient and dependent on the coal companies. And it ensured that these coal bosses in West Virginia were kind of going to be richer than God. You know, and in these company towns, the fake money was used to pay for lodging, supplies, and utilities. These towns were all also primarily in non-union areas in southern West Virginia. These towns also had mercenaries hired by the coal bosses to ensure that the miners would stay in line and not unionize. The coal bosses called these places company towns. But in reality, they were forced labor camps. Eventually, the Nazis would look at this and go, hey, that's actually not a bad idea. You know? <laughs> Pretty decent idea these guys are coming up with. But up north, the United Mine Workers of America, or the U uh, UMWA, or the Miners Union, had partnered with the International Workers of the World to engage in strikes. Mother Jones, the Ochnergerian activist, joined UMWA and Eugene Debs in Pittsburgh, my hometown of Pittsburgh, to lead a pretty massive strike in 1897, which was the first victory for the Miners Union. They were having a lot of trouble gaining uh, a foothold, especially in places like Pennsylvania and West Virginia. And in 1897, they, they struck a pretty major victory thanks to the UMWA, Mother Jones, and Eugene Debs. Now, following all this, Mother Joan, uh, she also led strikes and demonstrates, demonstrations all across Pennsylvania. Mother Jones was a, a huge, huge ag advocate for getting rid of child labor, right? She led a, a protest of young kids that worked in factories and mines on a march to Teddy Roosevelt's summer home in 1903. And I'm sure all of the rich folks, you know, that were sipping tea on their estates were shocked were just shocked at what was happening, you know, and they looked out at Mother Jones and they said, well, I mean, come on, why do you have to make child labor so political? You know, you're just <laughs> <laughs> politicizing all this ch children working. <laughs> By the way, Mother Jones might literally be the only person that Teddy Roosevelt was terrified of, which is awesome <laughs> in, my, in my book. <laughs> now, Eventually, she did go down to West Virginia to survey some of these mines, right? When she saw the conditions of workers down there, she said that this was worse than those in Tsarist Russia. That's right, folks. Authoritarian Russians drew a line at slave labor camps, and American industrialists basically said, but what if we sold the idea to, like, German nationalists, though? Would you guys... Would that be cool? <laughs> now, 
if you really think about it today, like these work conditions aren't particularly all that different, right? We've, we've heard stories from Amazon warehouses where people are passing out from dehydration, right? Meat packing plants have unsanitary conditions for their workers cramped in one space for hours on end. And especially now we, we've seen a lot, of, a, a, lot of, uh, a lot of people that work in these meat packing plants uh, get uh, COVID-19, they, uh, they get the virus, right? Uh, it spreads very quickly within those work environments. Walmart employees are paid so little that customers have to help them buy food. And there, there's an intern right now that has to pretend that Joe Biden isn't a warmongering sociopathic racist on Twitter every single day, you guys. <laughs> that is somebody's job. And, <laughs> and not just that, there are people who have to be paid to be Mitch McConnell's friend. Okay. <laughs> That's a shitty job. Yeah. Oh my God. <laughs> I'm, guys, I'm fairly oh, sure. The working class has got to rise up. That's enough. Yeah, that's yeah. it. <laughs> I think that's 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 the call, right? That's the call to just be like shut it down. <laughs> I'm pretty sure that last one is uh, a violation of the Geneva Conventions, you guys. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> now. In order to prevent the UMWA from gaining a foothold in West Virginia, the coal bosses came up with something called yellow dog contracts in 1907. These contracts were uh, basically said that miners were the sole employees, a term that's used very loosely in this circumstance, uh, of the coal company. And they are by law not allowed to join any union. And these laws, these contracts specifically called out the United Mine Workers of America and the International Workers of the World. And if they did join a union, they would be terminated and evicted from their homes by the coal companies. Boo. Yes, boo is the correct response to that. <laughs> uh, in 1917, the U.S. Supreme Court made them legally binding and ensured that the unions couldn't gain an attraction in the states where uh, they were using things like yellow dog contracts, right? The provision of the coal companies were, uh, to the coal companies was that, you know, they had to like walk the miners once a day uh, and make sure that they were going to be fed and clean up after their poopies. Uh, they really had to show that they were like ready for the responsibility of owning a miner, you know? It's a, it's a big responsibility. And then the, at, at the end of the day, the Supreme Court of 1917 was really asking, you know, who's walking who? That's really the question. And after a series of general strikes and mass organizing, finally in 1933, the yellow dog contracts were put down like that feral rabies-ridden canine at the end of that one movie. Uh, what was it? Uh, oh yeah, Marnie and Me. You guys remember that? <laughs> <laughs> Now, these contracts, much like the script, were meant to keep employees in fear and subservient to the whims of the coal bosses, especially since the labor movement was getting wind of their tyranny. It made sure that these workers today wouldn't resist or strike and would be loyal, kind of like a yellow dog, right? Now, today, we don't really need yellow dog contracts because we have the burden of health care. With the power of healthcare connected to your work, it's easy to see how employees can be kept subservient under the threat of losing access to a doctor, not just for them, but for their entire family. Coal miners all around the world, or, or rather all around the country, uh, were, were basically treated less valuable than the coal that they were extracting from the mountains. Make you work unsafe for anything, wouldn't well, Oh, yeah. No, and no, I are. No, I are. The miner would leave before daylight and to be away in the, that night before he get home. Mm -hmm. I've come in, I've come in late in the floor, or maybe two, three, four hours sleep 
When you come in, never change, never, never take a bath. If you get, lay down on the floor and sleep, and you get me up, put me out of the next morning, back to work again. So, fast forward to 1913. Uh, in Paint and Cabin Creek, West Virginia, the miners did go on a strike, backed by the Miners Union and Mother Jones. The miners were basically asking for union legitimacy and better wages. And by better wages, they meant like, you know, like real money. <laughs> now, the coal company basically freaked out and said that the union was working for a competitor uh, and was out to ruin their business. I mean, does this kind of make the coal bosses sound like crazy, paranoid prospectors? Right? They're just like, oh, look out, they're coming for my gold. Oh, my black gold. Oh, no. <laughs> just... <laughs> they're prospectors, but they're also ghosts, you know? Because... <laughs> <laughs> this is from 1913. You can't expect it. So there were also prospector coats. <laughs> now, as retaliation for asking for, you know, like real money and human rights, uh, the coal bosses hired the Baldwin Feltz Detective Agency. And now these guys weren't as much detectives as they were like hired mercenaries, you know? Honestly, if they went by Baldwin Feltz Union Hunters, it would have been way more accurate. But it would have, I'll admit, it would have kind of made them look bad, right? It kind of made them look like a bunch of assholes. Now, before <laughs> the, it would have, yeah. But before the yeah. SS invented, yeah, before the Nazis invented the SS, they looked at these so-called detective agencies and were like, that's not a bad idea, you guys. Oh, Jesus man. Christ. <laughs> <laughs> but we gotta upgrade we gotta upgrade our detective agency so we're gonna give them cool lightning bolts on their uniform you know really <laughs> brand this fascism oh my god very important <laughs> guys none of us here can say that the coal companies weren't inspirational just depends on who you're inspiring <laughs> got me there <laughs> Now, the coal companies basically gave these mercenaries machine guns and set up encampments to fire on striking miners. So the miners fought back with guerrilla warfare. Martial law was instated three times, which was virtually unprecedented in peacetime, right? 200 strikers, including the 86-year-old Mother Jones, were, was arrested uh, by the end of the strike. And you really got to... Yeah, guys, you really got to watch out for those octogenarians, okay? With their frail backs and, and their canes, you know, and their hard candies, which is a dental nightmare. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> I mean, you say that, but Mother Jones was that bitch. <laughs> yeah. It's true. Yeah. She did, <laughs> she did scare the shit out of Teddy Roosevelt, so... <laughs> I would have. I, I, she had the big stick. She had the big stick. <laughs> I would have. I would have bet as they were arresting her, she had like some badass line, like "You think these prisons can hold me?" And they're just. <laughs> 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 <You know? laughs> like that's the kind of harsh talking to that she probably gave them. <laughs> I know your. I know your mother, young man. <laughs> 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 Penning her a letter. <laughs> now, uh, eventually, the, the new governor of West Virginia, Governor Hatfield, pardoned some of these strikers, right? But he kept the main organizers of the strike in prison, such as Mother Jones. Uh, and the cherry on the authoritarian cake was when he closed down every single one of the town's socialist newspapers because... Well, I don't know. Let's just say, like, liberty or, or like, freedoms. Uh, and, I, I, like, Russia. Let's just go ahead and say those three things. Because that seems fair. USA. 
USA. (laughs) 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 Now, the next major strike in West Virginia wouldn't happen until 1920. Right? The UMWA had launched a major campaign to unionize coal mines in southern West Virginia specifically. As retaliation with the now legally binding yellow dog contracts, 3,000 miners were fired and served eviction notices. When the miners didn't leave, the Baldwin Feltz thugs were called in to violently remove them from their homes. In the town of Maituan in Mingo County, Al and Lee Feltz, the lead mercenaries of the Baldwin Feltz, some people would like to call them owners, but they're they're the lead mercenaries. That's what they are. Now, they came down to personally evict some of these miners, right? Uh, Now, Maituan's strike-supporting sheriff, Sid Hatfield, was backing the miners up, and the Feltz decided that uh, they need to push women and children out out of their homes at gunpoint because they really respect that rule of women and children first, you know? They're very old school. You gotta respect those traditional rules. Like if this was like the Titanic, they would have thrown the women and children overboard first. That's how traditional they were. And that's called equality, you guys. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. really how you got to do it. (laughs) (laughs) So the Feltz with the mayor of Meituan took these miners' families to the train station to evict them. So Sid Hatfield with a group of miners followed them to the train station and said that the Feltz were under arrest for unlawful eviction. Then the Feltz said that Sid Hatfield was under arrest because... Uh, they said so, and no taxi backsies. So, <laughs> <laughs> laid down the law. <laughs> now, eventually, during this heated exchange, shots were fired. And I'm not talking about, like, in a verbal way, right? Like, somebody didn't come out and was just like, yo, mama's so fat, her bathtub calls her Grover Cleveland. Like, it's uh... <laughs> 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 Hey, those are fighting words, man. <laughs> yeah. By the way, I would have fucking killed it as a comedian in 1921. I would have nailed it. <laughs> <laughs> but no, a little, there was like a literal, there was literal gunfire, right? And there was a lot of arguments after this happened about who shot first. And the answer is, uh, it was Han. Han definitely shot first. first (laughs) No doubt in my mind. (laughs) Now, the shootout lasted about 10 minutes. And within those 10 minutes, seven detectives, two miners, and the mayor of Beituan himself were killed. 17 strikers and Sid Hatfield were tried for, I don't know, uh, like not worshiping coal and Russianism. I did. I do think that they meant to probably say Bolshevism, but Russianism kind of sounds scarier, doesn't it? Like, like when I said that, couldn't you just see like two bearded men with hammers and sickles, like trying to hunt down a family of bald eagles? Couldn't you just see that? (laughs) 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 Now, in 1921, they <laughs> did get acquitted. These folks did get acquitted, but Sid Hatfield was murdered by the Baldwin Feltz in front of the courthouse. This essentially sparked a 5,000 miner march to Charleston. Back, back by the UMWA, these miners with their red neckerchiefs tied on tight, they basically said that they were not going to back down until their demands were met. And at this point, they had been lied to by the coal bosses. The courts had let them down by legitimizing yellow dog contracts. And the government had let them down by arresting strikers by by the use of mercenaries. So they trusted the unions who were on the side of these working class miners. President Harding, who was the president at the time, sent down Brigadier General Henry Bandholtz uh, to, to basically offer an ultimatum to the miners. 
right? But the miners rejected any compromise and kept the march going to Logan County. The sheriff of Logan County was a man named Dan Chafin, who, was an, who basically was an anti-union employee of the coal companies and was set on stopping these miners. The coal companies sent uh, their private armed forces and then Sheriff Chaffin deputized a bunch of uh, citizens in Logan counties. They called themselves the Logan Defenders. And then they killed five strike supporters as a message to the unions. By the time the miners did get to Logan County, Schaffen's men were armed with Gatling guns. So the miners with their rifles and handguns fought back against this private army of the coal company. Now the military was ordered to use their bombers, but they declined to fire on citizens. So Schaffen went to the coal companies and he chartered three biplanes and dropped homemade explosives on the miners. And once the federal troops were ordered to get involved, the miners knew that they were going to be outgunned and outnumbered, so they surrendered. Now this is, what's, this is what we historically know as the Battle of Blair Mountain. This is a major moment in American history where not only were federal troops called on striking citizens, but a private corporation paid for the bombing of said citizens. And this is another example of how strikers made the decision to call off the violence and not the corporatists. Violence is pretty much like second nature to capitalists at this point. This right here is said to be a pretty major loss to the UMWA, but it did show the coal companies that the workers weren't going to back down without a fight. And this isn't taught to most of us because this history shows what we are capable of when we stand together and push back against tyrannical power structures. It shows us how much strength the working class actually has. Now, the, the radical history of West Virginia is hidden from people by the use of legislative uh, depowering of the unions and the labor movement and a propaganda campaign to make the people of the believe that they're less than. The coal companies are now using new tactics of covering up the power of, the, of labor history in West Virginia itself. One of the newer ways that they're doing it uh, is, uh, is mountaintop removal, right? Mountaintop removal is a new way for them to essentially destroy the land uh, that these, uh, that, that is a hold the history of West Virginia uh, in them uh, all together. Now, mountaintop removal is exactly what it sounds like. It's removing the top of a mountain with explosives, right, to get to that nougaty, coaly center, you know? <laughs> and it begs the question, how many licks of a stick of dynamite does it take to get to the center of a mountaintop? <laughs> <laughs> and that's... And that's very silly, you guys, because they're very clearly using C4. They are definitely <laughs> <laughs> using C4. Now, mountaintop removal is not just a destructive way of getting coal, uh, but it's also a way of getting rid of archaeological evidence that shows exactly what happened at Blair Mountain. We're going in with metal detectors. We're not finding anything made after 1921. That means that those artifacts are dated before 1921, which puts them right at the time of this battle. Most of the miners probably just pulled their squirrel gun or their deer gun out of the closet and a, f a couple of boxes of ammunition and they went to war. And I found miners' bullets coming all the way up, right? And so now we're seeing the defensive parts right here, a whole bunch of fired rounds, and then we just now found an incoming round. Now, when you have a lot of spent bullets like that, uh, the lead part, then you think, hey, there was some pretty close quarters here. And so you think the miners were really putting the heat on them. Right down over the hill, we found some patterning of pistol rounds, which are short range weapons. But the things you find in the soil don't lie. They tell the truth. And they've been there for 90 years. And, and then all of a sudden, they start testifying. Now, the corporations have used their wealth and legislative strongholds to normalize this kind of obliteration. 
these communities don't realize that they're in an abusive relationship because they don't know anything else exists, right? The reason why these companies are resorting to mountaintop removal is because coal is a dying industry. After World War II, the jobs in a coal mine became way more automated. And it's difficult to get, to get people to, to see that fact when the culture of the state has been ingrained and entangled into this industry. The people are the industry and the industry are the people. So when you go after this industry, people think that you're going after them personally. And, you know, to combat this idea, I feel like, you know, Tyler Durden summarized this pretty well. We're not your job. You're not how much money you have in the bank. Not the car you drive. Not the contents of your wallet. Not your fucking khakis. Just have, I think uh, Yellow Dog Contracts have banned Fight Club in West Virginia, by the way. <laughs> they did ban that movie. But this is why the notion of jobs retraining and it is so difficult in areas like West Virginia, right? A lot of people have been convinced that coal mining is the only way of life. And Democrats come out in, into areas like this and claim that they're willing to retrain these folks, but never really say in what. I mean, there's plenty of jobs that exist. We just have to give them a chance to flourish. And as my friend Eleanor Goldfield says, you can pretty much have a job in damn near anything. Uh, and the importance of recognizing that labor rights uh, organizing is the antidote and the answer to the, the, the coming issues that we're going to face. But absolutely, I, and, and, and the thing that they've done in coal country and now in fracking country as well, is really hold that over people's heads. Like, well, you have to have these coal mines, you have to have these pipelines and these well pads and, uh, and things like that, because what are you gonna do without jobs? When in reality, uh, as you've noted too, you could give people jobs doing anything. The idea that you'd have to give people jobs destroying the planet and their own bodies uh, is really absurd, and it really just speaks to the oppressive nature of the capitalist system that places profit above people at every turn. Uh, and I think that uh, West Virginia is that kind of, uh, that, that sign on the road that says this is what's up ahead. We need plenty of jobs, right? We need jobs in the reclamation of land, renewable energies, counseling, drug rehab, especially in a state like West Virginia that's been hit so hard by the opioid crisis. You know, we need a job where, where someone goes in and just kind of punches a mining CEO in the chest like once a day. <laughs> <You know? laughs> that's, a, that's a job. And I, I get it. Some of you guys are looking at me going, well, Chris, why not the dick, right? That's, that's sort of like your signature move, the dick punch. Like that's, <laughs> that's, that's your signature thing. And I would say that in this situation, it is pertinent to go for the chest because a lot of these mining CEOs are all wearing oxygen tanks, right? So I think they'll really get the message of how they're shortening the breath of humanity and the planet when they're like really shortening in their own breath. You know, so it's like um, it's like mixed martial arts, but just with like metaphors, but also punching. <laughs> I, I like to call it mixed metaphoric arts. Fun. <laughs> <laughs> it's fun. Look, at this point, we shouldn't even have coal as a source of energy, considering the vast amount of ecological damage it causes. Right? Before coal is burned, it has to be cleaned. So it's cleaned in a chemical bath and it creates a nice oozy slurry called coal sludge, which is essentially a cocktail of poisonous heavy metals. When they wash coal, the dirty water, the affluent that comes off is called coal slurry or coal sludge. It's often a thick black. Uh, pitch or tar-like substance, and it's full of heavy metals. It's full of things like mercury and chromium and lead and arsenic and cadmium and selenium. There's all these different things inside of that dirty water, so it's not just mud, it's a heavy metal cocktail.
toxic industrial waste and they have to do something with it because there's no easy way to clean that water. They often just build an unlined earth dam between two mountains and they create these vast ponds called slurry impoundments. And they pump this liquid back there where it sits and festers for the rest of eternity. And I do believe that we've seen something like coal sludge uh, I believe that it was uh, represented in an episode of Star Trek The Next Generation. No. No. What is no. it, one? No. What are you seeing? No. Trouble. <laughs> I'm mad at you for bringing this clip up, Chris. I'm, I'm, <laughs> oh, no. I'm triggered. I'm triggered. Oh, no. We'll talk about it afterwards. Look, this... We're we going to talk after this. We gonna... <laughs> yes. <laughs> the, this, this sludge, can, uh, can, it, it basically contaminates the water supply, right? Even the cleaners that they use to clean the sludge gets into the water supply and poisons it. And politicians approve of whatever these coal companies do and how much ever of these poisonous cleaners they want to use because they call they say that it's proprietary. For lack of a better term, MCHM is like the detergent. Okay. So the coal, is, the raw coal is put into these huge tanks swirling around with water in this MCHM and it separates the coal from the dirt and dust and debris because those okay. things are not good for the burners at the power plant. They clog the jets and other okay. stuff. The interesting thing about this uh, water crisis, as they call it, was this chemical leaks into the water. Um, they downplayed it for one. For two, the very first thing that the governor said when he came on the news was, I just need everyone to know this had nothing to do with coal. So the campaign to protect coal started as soon as the crisis started. They would never tell us what was in it. They would never tell us what was uh, safe levels. There were people going to the emergency room with nosebleeds and respiratory distress and all manners of things. In the end of the day, they gave us some number and said, this is the safe level and we're, we're well below that. We don't need to worry. Well, it turns out they just made that number up. And it turns out the safe level of this was nowhere near, you know, they said you could be up here and it's still safe. It turns out it takes very little of that stuff to damage um, your health. And further than all of that, we found out later that the real harm from this, aside from the immediate acute things like the nosebleeds and the respiratory distress, was that it affects reproductive functions. So it could be a generation or two before the real effects of this chemical spill are seen on the people here. And look, right, I'm, I'm sure that some of the machismo people that, that, that have just kind of normalized these, these things will come out and they'll say, oh, come on, you know, water is supposed to be a little hard, you know, you liberals and your filtered <laughs> water. Yeah. Who are you, the king of England? Huh? Quit being such a pussy and, and, and drink that water that causes you know, minor, minor brain damage and genetic defects. It's, <laughs> that's good for you. That's... It's good for you. Put some hair on your chest and maybe like an ear, you know? <laughs> that was not the appendage I was hoping for. But okay. <laughs> it's never the appendage we're hoping for. <laughs> Which, you know, I, silly me, I forgot that, you know, wanting clean water and being alive is it's like a sign of cowardice and like suicidality is manly or whatever the fuck they want to push out there and and if this sludge wasn't enough coal companies have compression stations that create non-stop noise all right we bought this property back in 2004 uh, it was raw land and bought it to move here for peace and quiet from retirement. 
and not too long after we started building is when they decided to build a compressor station next door to us. So our peace and quiet went away. That first year was like trying to live in the middle of a truck stop with all of the 18 wheelers running all night long. They Fair did up. this noise <laughs> test before they started making noise. Yeah, and not only that, but when these plants have accidents or causes fires or anything, the people in these towns are, are not warned about them at all. In 2017, a storage tank at Saturn Station caught fire. Mariana tells me that she urged both industry and lawmakers to at the very least set up a warning system, something that could alert folks who live nearby, let them know to evacuate or to not drive down that very narrow road. EQT, the company who owns Saturn Station, never released a reason for the incident, nor have any new safety precautions or an escape route been set up for the community. But the propaganda has permeated through the culture so much that these coal companies and coal plants just wind up staying well past their welcome. And this is really where I feel like religion has failed all of us. You know, it's really astounding to me that we haven't made a full investment in solar, considering how many religions worship the damn sun. Right? I mean, if Ra or Surya, who are both sun gods, <laughs> saw our dependency on fossil fuels, they'd solar flare us out of existence. <laughs> Infidels. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they look at us look at us and just say, "Hey, assholes, we kind of gave you this infinite renewable source of energy, okay that that stuff wasn't meant for you guys to dig up. That's why it was buried so far under the earth <laughs> <laughs> fuck, fuck why didn't we even gift you guys with logic if you're just gonna do dumb shit like this. Oh, oh good. Oh great. You're gonna you're gonna write another country song about going to war and burning fossil fuels with your truck. This is ridiculous. Okay. Yeah, we're moving to Mars. Fuck you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Also, why does your Ford F-150 need testicles? What? What is it is an inanimate object and does not need a gender. It's bullshit. Of this <laughs> yeah. uh, and also the term <laughs> oh my God. is co-opted by this culture too uh, by normalizing ignorance and destruction right the term that redneck is one of solidarity for striking miners they would tie red bandanas or neckerchiefs around their neck to signify who they were and where they stood and this was a symbol of pride within the working class uh, even if we look at something like the term redneck, uh, which has been propagandized and twisted uh, to mean something different in today's world, actually comes from the labor rights background. The term redneck was started by white and black mine workers who tied on red bandanas and marched together for basic workers' rights and actually won basic workers' rights uh, during the mine wars at the beginning of the 20th century. So it's really important to, uh, to, to bring back this radical history and let it guide uh, as we build and organize into, in our present day. Today we look at the term redneck as a slur for someone that's inbred or gun-toting and racist and kind of dumb, right? But that definition, and that definition that I just gave you is, is championed right, and worn as a badge of honor in places like West Virginia. And it really comes from how popular culture has taken and warped that definition and turned ignorance into a way of life. The term redneck is co-opted by millionaire entertainers like Jeff Foxworthy, who used it as the butt of, their, butt of the joke in their very famous routine, the, the you might be a redneck routine, right? Which culturally contributed to burying the real meaning of that word. And he used comedy to do it, which really makes him a traitor <laughs> to the art. You know, I take that one personally. Comedy is supposed to speak truth to power. Not I like that. <laughs> oh my God.
right? It's not, it's not supposed to help fucking redefine a movement that stood up to stop tyranny. <laughs> And Jeff Foxworthy isn't even a real redneck by, the, by even his own definition of, of what a redneck is, right? He grew up in the suburbs of Atlanta. His dad had a great job with IBM and he attended Georgia Tech. Yeah, I really don't think that routine should be called you might be a redneck. <laughs> <laughs> no. Yeah. Ron, Ron White is the only real one of that bunch. He really that is. is true. He is really the only real one of that the bunch. Only one of that bunch. If Jeff Foxworthy was going to be more honest about it, he would he would change the name of that bit to "You Might Be Privileged." <laughs> <laughs> Look, Foxworthy is as much of a redneck as I am a Bollywood dancer. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, oh, oh my god. <laughs> Jeff, <laughs> Jeff Foxworthy is a turncoat and a fraud that buried the true radical history of that term. He turned it into a product and built a he built it into a brand to sell merch to champion ignorance. People like Jeff Foxworthy, Garth Brooks, Toby Keith are all profiting from warping the reality and telling people to take pride in their anti-intellectualism. Now, mix that pop culture in with some of the political propaganda that's out there, and you get things like the Friends of Coal. Who are the Friends of Coal, you might ask? We have something around here, and I don't know if you've ever... Friends of Coal. Any man in a right mind ought to go and look and who set that up? Who, you know, who profits from this little friend's code? We have license plates now. Uh, yeah, I tell you who likes it. Chamber of Commerce, who don't like unions, who don't like pensions, who don't like health care, because they fight against all these issues. The Chamber of Commerce fights against every, every, every one of these issues. You have the coal vendors who profit from selling to these companies, you know. That, that they understand what friends of coal means. Uh, you have your politicians who are owned by the coal companies. They understand what it means. They're the ones that help got all get gets all the shit passed, you know. Mm. So the the people that really profit from it understands what friends of coal is. If you if you live in West Virginia and write propaganda against unions, pensions, Medicare for all, and convince the people to give up their land for the destruction of nature, then you might be a friend of coal. <laughs> <laughs> oh, can you send me the link? <laughs> that one segment is better than all of Jeff Foxworthy's plans. <laughs> And I've noticed two kinds of vehicles that have those glass plates on. And I think it pretty well describes what what it is. You either pass a big black suburban that costs about fifty five or sixty thousand dollars and you'll see that friends of gold license plate on the back of it. Or you'll pass some little guy in an eighty four S ten with the fenders falling off of it with a friends of gold license plate. When the first vehicle you passed really understood understood what a friend called what he he understood why he had that last plate. The other guy that was driving that eighty four S ten with the fenders falling off didn't understand it. What he really needed was a friend of coal miners license plate, you know, but he didn't understand that. And I think that's what they done to us around here is propaganda. Uh, Those folks are the ones that get excited when Trump says things like, oh, we're bringing back coal. We're gonna bring back coal. And look, in this one instance, I don't think Trump is lying. He is going to bring back coal. By continuing to pump propaganda for these tree killers, we might fund our own extinction. So in a few million years, our fossilized remains can turn into coal, you know, like for a society that's, moved on from this destructive fuel source and is now using a combination of solar and wind and looks at our era as the dark ages. So in that way, you know, he's not lying. <laughs>
he's going to make more coal, just not for us. The positive in all this, though, is that in the last few years, there have been a bunch of coal companies going completely bankrupt. The coal company Black Jewel went bankrupt in 2019 and owed miners a back pay of $6,000 each. And they were in clear violation of the Warren Act, which claims that a company must give 60-day written, uh, a 60 day written warning about mass layoffs. Now, the miners protested and led strikes blocking train lines till the company paid them, which they eventually did. And by the way, the United Mine Workers of America is also shifting its union prowess into the renewable sector and various other uh, job markets as well, because they have seen the writing on the wall for coal for several years now. Uh, one, one former coal miner told me, he's like, you want to make environmentalists? I'll tell you how to make environmentalists. You take 500 coal miners out of the mines and you put them to work in some renewable energy project. Um, you know, give them something to do. Yeah, so I think something that's really interesting is uh, the, the UMWA, which is the United Mine Workers of America, uh, which used to be one of the most powerful unions, um, is now spreading itself into areas that are not coal mining. Uh, you know, they have uh, they have UMWA members that work at hospitals and UMWA members that work in, in, in other industries besides coal. And uh, the goal is for, you know, a lot of folks in the UMWA is to have a presence in the renewable energy sector. Um, so a lot of people are, are pushing for that and using this sort of strength of unions, you know, this collective strength to push for that. And look, the coal companies, you know, apparently couldn't see the writing on the wall because, guys, it's so dark. It's very dark in those mines. You can't see writing <laughs> inside of a coal mine. And look, besides, the CEOs of these coal companies aren't going into those mines. You know, they, they, don't, they don't have the right outfits to really go oh. into those coal mines, <laughs> right? Yeah. Guys, Armani is not making overalls. They're just yeah. not... They're they're not proletarian enough. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but look, the spirit of the striking miners is alive and well in West Virginia. It's just moved over to a different job nowadays. It's moved over to teachers. In 2018 and 2019, we saw a bunch of teacher strikes that were asking for better wages and better treatment. And since technically they're considered federal employees, this was illegal for them to do, but it was also illegal for miners to strike because of yellow dog contracts. This didn't stop either group of real rednecks from fighting for what's right. And therein lies the spirit of what West Virginia really is. It's a hotbed for labor action to drive change. It's citizens from the rank and file coming out and saying, we don't believe in and nor will we follow these laws that are in place. And until they change that, we will not contribute to an unjust, unlawful, and tyrannical system. And the message spread all around the country. There were strikes in LA, Colorado, and various other industries joined in on these strikes, right? Now, the corporate school boards decided to use old tricks and tried to split the teachers up. In Denver, the school boards threatened to call ICE, the Immigration and the Customs Enforcement, on immigrant teachers. In Denver, the school board threatened the union that if they went on strike, the city would report the immigrant teachers to the immigration authorities. This was obviously done to intimidate, to scare, to split the teachers between those born in the United States and those with one or another immigrant status because they have a hold on the immigrant. They can intimidate and scare the immigrant just like the authorities in Denver did and split them away from other workers and use them against the other workers. And this goes to show 
how much corporations are willing to manipulate immigrants to get their way, just like the coal bosses did back in the 1890s, right? This is the, basically the school board saying that the immigrant teachers belong to them and not in solidarity with the unions, but it did not work. Look, the people in West Virginia are, are seen as this new definition of the redneck, right? The inbred dumb backwoods hick that's ready to turn everything into an explosive. <laughs> but that doesn't really sound like a redneck to me, right? It kind of sounds like an imperialist to me, you know? Usually imperialists of the highest class want yeah. to keep their blood pure, right? Which leads to a lot of inbreeding. You know, they're always just like, Chuck, this is your cousin Tiffany, and you are to be wed to make sure that our lineage stays as pure as the rice we eat. Oh, okay. Oh, stop. 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 <laughs> stop. Purity is our power. Genetic abnormalities is our gift. <laughs> <laughs> now, this is probably why people are fine with being poisoned by cleaning chemicals from coal companies, right? And you can kind of see this unintelligence in the way every one of our politicians talks and whenever they open their mouth, right? The fuck, the Democratic Party frontrunner struggles to finish a basic sentence without saying something racist, you know? <laughs> And the imperialists, they always want to turn something into a bomb. You know, people are like, hey, look, we created a new way of transporting people long distances, and we're calling it an airplane. And the imperialists were like, well, this is great. We love this. Now, can we add an explosive device that can be dropped anywhere? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Spot on. <laughs> yeah. yeah. How many guns can we put on it? Is it all of them? Can we put all of the guns? <laughs> and and where can we put the testicles on the plane? Where can we? Have that? <laughs> where they flap? They where flap. They fla yeah, that's yeah. <laughs> Look, so the next time you want to call someone ignorant, racist, violent, and hell bent on their own destruction, don't don't call them a redneck. Call them an imperialist. But if you're willing to fight for equality and basic human rights and dignity, then you might be a true redneck. And that's been your fork full of noodles for this week. Thank you so much for tuning in. If you enjoyed this episode, please, please hit that subscribe button. Hit the bell icon. Make sure you get notifications from us. Hit the like button. Hit the share button. Get the word out about this show. Uh, content like this is often suppressed on a lot of the more mainstream corporate uh, video platforms. Uh, so, uh, and I think you guys know which one I'm talking about. Uh, so I depend on you guys to, to hit that like button, hit that share button, get the word out about these, uh, uh, about these videos, about these shows. Uh, and uh, there's also multiple different ways that you can, you can support a show like this. Uh, if you listen to the audio version of this show, you can write a review. If you listen to the video version, you can leave a comment. All of that stuff helps it uh, get, get seen by more people. Uh, but one of the things um, that you can do to financially contribute is either make a one-time donation or become a sustaining member. Uh, sustaining members get uh, early access to full episodes of Forkful of Noodles. You get early access to albums. You get unreleased stand-up comedy and storytelling material. Uh, you get a bunch of cool stuff uh, every single week delivered directly into either your email or on the Patreon page. Various different ways where you can become a sustaining member you can become a sustaining member uh on on patreon on paypal on directly on my website itself uh you can become a sustaining member on on Bandcamp. various different ways that you can do it uh this just helps shows like this grow and uh it, it just makes the quality and quantity of the show get better and better uh, i'm going to be doing a bunch of of these uh, these live virtual stand-up comedy shows, uh, as I mentioned at the top of the show. So uh, go to my website and uh, and check out when the next one is, especially if you want to be a part of the live virtual stand-up comedy audience. Go to krishmohanhaha.com. That's K-R-I-S-H-M-O-H-A-N. 
H-A-H-A dot com to check out all of the, 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 the live virtual stand-up comedy dates, the uh, sustaining memberships. My album is available on, on my website as well. There's a bunch of cool shit on there. Uh, we're we're, we're going to be throwing up a bunch of videos on this channel, um, various different kinds of videos, videos like Forkful of Noodles, more current events related videos, more looser ranty videos uh, as well. So there's a ton of content that comes out on this channel. Uh, we have, we're going to have some interviews that are going to be coming out as well. So uh, stay tuned. Make sure you're subscribed. Make sure you're getting notifications. Uh, until the next one, thanks for tuning in.